All right, we are live this evening with uh, ERW historian, multi-talented historian, uh, although he, he is a Steelers fan, we'll let that one slide, uh, with uh, author Bert Dunkerley. I am Dan Welch of Emerging Revolutionary War, and tonight we're going to be talking about uh, Bert's newest book, Decision at Brandywine, The Battle at Birmingham Hill. Um, I was chatting with Bert a little bit before we began this evening, and uh, uh, you're in for one heck of a talk tonight about this important moment in the Brandywine battle and campaign. Uh, it's definitely a, a book that you're going to want to pick up after uh, the end of our, our talk tonight with Bert. Uh, before we get into uh, the author spotlight this evening, though, I do want to highlight some of the, the many things going on at Emerging Revolutionary War uh, that will give you a little bit more information about uh, towards the end of the program this evening. Uh, but to keep on your radar screens, uh, Emerging Revolutionary War second annual bus tour this year will be held in November. We'll be visiting the sites of Valley Forge and Monmouth uh, with ERW historians uh, as our guides, Phil Greenwald and Billy Griffith. Uh, we also have got a slate of upcoming uh, ERW revelries that uh, we'll share with you at the end of the program that we hope you can join us uh, for in the coming weeks and months. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Emerging Revolutionary Wars uh, Symposium coming up uh, in the early fall as well. So we'll give you all those details at the end of the program this evening, but uh, just want to plug those and make sure that they are continually on your radar. So as I mentioned tonight, uh, we are on with Bert Dunkerley, author of Decision at Brandywine, the Battle of Birmingham Hill, or the Battle for Birmingham Hill. Uh, Bert, uh, you've published a lot of books, uh, both in the Civil War and Rev War areas of history. Uh, what drew you to this specific spot uh, during the Revolutionary War? I've always been interested in the Battle of Brandywine. And um, I remember visiting as a kid. And of course, uh, you know, you don't understand the big picture when you're, when you're young and, and learning. But as I returned over the years and visited the site, and a lot of people probably know that there is a state historic site. It's, it's a Pennsylvania state park. Um, that state historic site actually doesn't preserve any battlefield land. It, it's behind the area of fighting. So the state owns uh, a couple hundred acres and they own two historic structures, uh, the headquarters of Washington and the quarters of Lafayette. But the battle took place further away from that. And I started to, um, to really dive into that and wanted to know more about the actual battle where the fighting took place. And um, over time, some of the actual battlefield has been preserved. We can get into that more if you want to, but uh, now more of it is accessible. But anyway, I, I was just really interested in, in how this battle unfolded and specifically Birmingham Hill. That's the heart of battlefield. Yeah, and that's definitely one of the things um, I, I think our, our audience will be interested in tonight. I know it was definitely an interesting part of the book talking about the preservation uh, at Brandywine uh, over the last uh, almost 250 years. We're getting close and closer and closer uh, to that uh, anniversary for Rev War events. Um, but before we get to that part of the story, set the scene for us. What is happening in the weeks or months leading up to this campaign that will take place in Pennsylvania? Sure. Well, in the big picture, um, summer of 1777, the British have uh, plans to crush and end the rebellion. Uh, General William Howe is going to take his army from New York City, which the British have occupied uh, since the previous year, and uh, move down into the Chesapeake and come up into Maryland to capture Philadelphia, the capital, and another British army under uh, Burgoyne is going to move south from Canada uh, into New York State uh, towards Albany and uh, and cut the colonies off um, New England from from the New York. But um, one thing that I think is important is uh, looking in a little bit more detail at the Continental Army. Uh, the Continental Army goes through several phases of development, and I like to call it phase one and phase two. And phase one is the early period of the war when the revolution starts and uh, troops gather around Boston after Lexington and, and Concord. And uh, 
1776, we have a lot of units from New England and, and a few from the mid-Atlantic states, and most of them enlist for one year. And of course, uh, when the year is up uh, and it ends with the battles of Trenton and Princeton, um, a lot of those troops go home, their enlistments are up. And so the, the army has to recruit new units. And so in the spring of 1777, the army is in New Jersey, Northern New Jersey, and we have new units arriving through the spring. Uh, some were already there, but a lot of them are new, and they get their first combat in, in small skirmishes and battles with the British in northern New Jersey. But they don't fight a major battle until Brandywine. So Brandywine will be the first major battle for what I call version two of the Continental Army. And these are units that have been raised and enlisted for three years or the duration of the war. And uh, these are units that are going to fight throughout the rest of the, the campaign. So, you know, from Valley Forge through Monmouth and on all the way on to Yorktown. So Brandywine is the first battle for a lot of these units. And it's the first time that any of these units have fought in something so large uh, as brigades and divisions, not just fighting as regiments skirmishing with the British. I, you know, I think for those of you that are tuning in tonight, if you are really fans of, you know, traditional military history or battle studies, this is the way to go um, with Bert's book. It was, it was really refreshing um, to get into some of those points as you were talking about uh, that not only had many of these men not been in a significantly sized battle, but they hadn't been in it together in formations. You really get into the tactics of the day and talk about how these units uh, in, of the Continental Army had, may had participated uh, mostly at the regimental level, some maybe at the brigade level, uh, but had not really um, fought in a situation where they are working with military structures and organizations larger than those levels. And one of the things I found fascinating was how you went into the training uh, that these different units now coming together that are fighting on September 11th had experienced and how that's uh, going to affect the, the battle itself. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how the, 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 the differences of tactics and the differences of manuals being used are going to affect the Continentals that day? I think it's one of the most important and, and underappreciated aspects of the, the Pennsylvania campaign of uh, Brandywine, Germantown, uh, up into Valley Forge. And it gets into why Valley Forge is so important is it, it's not that the army survives a terrible winter because it wasn't that bad, but um, Von Steuben reforms the army's drill, what they would have called a manual, manual of arms. Manual of arms is the method that you use for loading and firing, marching and maneuvering, and it, it includes all the things like, uh, you know, going from, from line, when you're marching down a road, or I'm sorry, from column, when you're marching into line, where you deploy out into a field, and how the units load and fire. There are different steps to loading and firing a musket. A lot of, a lot of our viewers know that. And before the revolution, uh, there were a lot of different manuals out there. The British Army used a drill manual. There were different manuals that militia units used. Uh, a lot of them came from England. Uh, they've been used in the English militia systems. And so you have units who not only have never fought together before, they've never fought together on such a scale before, but they, in some cases, have trained using different manuals. So the commands are different, the timing is different. And when you've got everybody deployed like they will be on Birmingham Hill, um, coordinating that is a challenge. It's a challenge for the officers and, and for the troops. And all of that, it gets corrected when von Steuben uh, creates one manual for the Continental Army at Valley Forge. That's why Valley Forge is so important. It, it's a huge problem. Washington knows it's a problem. He can't address it. Um, he's busy, there's, there's a lot going on. Uh, he doesn't have a large staff. So, so Washington writes about it. He's anxious to get this issue corrected. 
but um, I really enjoyed researching that and talking about the, the differences in, in the steps to load and fire and how you move and, and move the musket around and all that. It's really important. Yeah, and you lay that out early in the work. So, you know, folks that are reading it can get an understanding that, yes, you know, the Continentals are defeated at Birmingham Hill. They are, they're, they're driven back. But when you start looking at some of those individual components to the battle, it's another challenge that the Continentals are facing that day um, that often doesn't get talked about in the historiography, but it has a huge impact on the line. Um, just even, uh, you know, at, at, at the 10,000 foot level where, you know, the, the Virginians and the Pennsylvanians standing next to each other are under two completely different uh, manuals, if you will, and operating completely differently, um, how it's going to later affect um, as they pull out and retreat from the hill. So it's definitely a key component to understanding, understanding the battle. So bring us in now to September 11th, um, 1777. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, if you can lay out what the, the two British columns are doing, uh, how Washington and the Continentals react to that, and, and bring us up into position uh, at Birmingham Hill. So uh, Brandywine Creek flows roughly north to south, and uh, the main road, which they call the post road, which stays Route 1, uh, crosses Brandywine Creek and goes on to Philadelphia. It was the main road that the British would have taken to approach the city. Washington deploys his army on uh, the high ground above the creek. And as the British approach, uh, General Howe comes up with the plan to divide his army. He'll send one wing straight ahead to occupy Washington's attention, make him think that's the main attack. And he sends the other wing, which he will accompany on a long march around. Uh, they leave early in the morning, uh, September 11th, and they march 15 miles. Huh. And, um, you know, they, they take one lunch break, if you will. Uh, but that's just something else to, to think about is that before they even fire a shot, those British troops have marched 15 miles over country roads. Uh, and they come around. Uh, behind the American army unsuspected. Washington had scouts. Uh, you know, this, this, he certainly knew that that was a possibility, but I think it was a combination of just bad luck that the scouts missed uh, the British coming. He did get reports, then he got contradictory reports that yes, they're coming, no, they're not. And it sort of freezes him because he doesn't, you know, know what decision to make. You can't, uh, start moving the army and then all of a sudden stop and move it back. It's not like stopping your car and turning around. If you start moving thousands of men in one direction, uh, you commit it. And, and you've got to make sure that that's what you really want to do. So uh, Washington has to very carefully weigh the decision to, to move his army. He finally gets confirmation that yes, they're, they're behind him and they're coming. And so it's around three in the afternoon that uh, he sends three divisions uh, to his right, to the north, to meet the British and stop them. And when Washington's men arrive, uh, these three divisions arrive, um, they're not up against uh, just any British units. Um, I think one of the things that you argue quite successfully is that the units that the Continentals are going to face that day are, are some of the best uh, in continental North America at the time. Can you talk a little bit about the composition of the, the British units and uh, some of the Germans that are with them that day? Well, and some of our, our fans know this, the, uh, the British Army regiments had uh, 10 companies, company 70 men, so uh, 10 companies in a regiment. Uh, eight of them are what they called line companies, they're, they're regular soldiers. Two of them were specialized. You had uh, grenadiers, guys who wore the big tall hats, and light infantry. Uh, light infantry wore small leather caps. They were specially trained to move quickly and skirmish and um, you know, do, do a little bit more complex fighting. Uh, the grenadiers were often the tallest men, and they were your shock troops. They, they did 
not carry hand grenades anymore, but they used to. And if anyone's curious, no, it's not nice. live. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, what the British Army did in North America was they often took those two special companies out of their regiments and put them together. So that meant that uh, your regular troops were left in each regiment, but they took all the light infantry and they put them together in a light infantry brigade. And all the grenadiers got pulled out of their regiments and put into a grenadier brigade, which meant you had two shock units, specialized, well-trained, highly motivated troops. Now the downside of course is that your uh, your regular regiments are under strength and uh, lack those special troops that might be needed. When Howe launches this flanking march, uh, he includes the, uh, the Grenadiers and the Light Infantry. Uh, the same thing is done with the Hessians or the German troops who are with them. Um, and they also have what they call Jaegers who are German riflemen. And they carry rifles, not muskets, and they're specially trained as marksmen. One last thing I'd like to add, I don't know if you were gonna ask this, but um, I did investigate the route of the 15 mile march and I walked it. Wow. And uh, I don't recommend it. it. It wasn't hard to do, but there's some pretty narrow roads and traffic moves pretty fast. <laughs> uh, Cause it's a lot of it's suburbia today. and. Uh, I found myself dodging traffic more than once, but it was worthwhile to see the terrain and to see what these guys went through. So you can really tell then that, you know, the British units that are arriving on the field, these are veterans, these are, are crack soldiers to not only be able to make a 15 mile uh, march into Washington's rear, but also then have enough left in the tank to push this attack forward um, over some unimaginable terrain that you talk about uh, throughout your narrative. Can you share with us a little bit, now that we've got, uh, we've got the Continentals up on the hill, we've got the British that have arrived, can you share with us what the, the battlefield looks like? Uh, what are these men um, going to experience as the British uh, soldiers in the ranks are attacking? What's the defensive position look like for, uh, for the Continental Line? The British uh, actually, they do take a break and they, as they would say, refresh themselves. Uh, they, they eat their rations, get some water, take a little breather, and then reform and continue their movement. And it's around four o'clock when they launch their attack. And it, it must have been one of the most impressive sights of the whole war. 9,000 uh, British and German troops in formation, you know, slowly advancing towards the enemy, uh, coming downhill and then moving uphill towards the Americans. Uh, the British are going to encounter fences, rail fences, which they'll have to tear down in their way. Uh, they'll encounter stone walls. This is farmland. There'll be some orchards, a few houses. Uh, but one of the other big obstacles is going to be that the terrain is, is rolling. It's, it's not a, a gentle slope straight up to Birmingham Hill. Uh, there's places where uh, they'll be sheltered because of the way the land slopes and there's places where they're going to be exposed and as they move forward they come immediately within artillery range the americans now, the americans uh, like i said have three divisions and you know they they arrive not at the same time uh two arrive and then the third moves up and it's it's very unfortunate you know they They've never been there. They don't know the, the, the terrain. They don't know the layout of things. So they, they set up the best they can under a very tight time frame. And um, the, the first two divisions under uh, Stephen and Sterling uh, take position, but then they have to shift uh, to their right to make room for the third division, which comes up. Um, and that third division never really gets in, in place properly. Um, and, and we can get more into that, but some of the more experienced American troops are caught off guard. They're caught not ready. They're not in position. They're still moving when they get fired upon. Uh, the Americans are on the top of Birmingham Hill, which uh, has a Quaker meeting house. 
the, the uh, Birmingham Meeting House was the prominent landmark there. And they're going to be able to see, for the most part, the British coming at them. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was analyze the terrain in, in great detail and look at the range of muskets and the range of artillery and what people could see from different points on the battlefield. And like I said, there's, there's places where the Americans could see the British the whole way. And there's places where the Americans could not see the British until they got very close. It just depended on where you are on a particular spot, like any battlefield. Right. And, and I think one of the things you mentioned talking about as the, as the British attack moves forward um, and they start getting within, you, you mentioned American artillery range, American rifle range. Um, you know, viewers, you can you can see uh, Bert's humongous library behind him. There's a portion of mine uh, behind me as well. Uh, as historians, we just absolutely love books. Uh, to read, to collect, uh, and for many other uses. Um, and one of the things I saw in your book, which kind of ties into what you were talking about, and I have never, ever seen uh, before, is on the maps that, that follow your narrative of the British assault, on the maps are placed the rifle ranges or the musket ranges and the artillery ranges, which I thought was in a, a very interesting addition. Um, so obviously that's an important component to the story that you're telling. Um, so uh, you definitely want to pick the book up for nothing else than to see these, these, these maps that show the artillery range and as the British move through their assault, where they come within range of the respective positions. And I, I was hoping if we can transition then to uh, the American position, particularly on the left, uh, as the, the Continentals are going into line, you talk about this shift. Uh, and the left of the line happens to be occupied by a number of Maryland troops um, as, as they go into position. As I'm reading the story about the Maryland visit, the, the Maryland troops, all I can think of is our own Marylander here at ERW, Phil Greenwald. I'm thinking, oh man, these Maryland guys, again. Sorry, Phil. I mean, what is going on? It's just, it's just generational, I guess, uh, of Marylanders letting us down. I mean, after all, they took, my, they took my sports team. They took the Browns. I mean, that was such a sad day here in Ohio. Uh, when, when they packed up and left for Baltimore. So talk a little bit about that aspect of the battle, because it's really going to hamper then, uh, as you call it, the, you know, the heart of the American line, the heart of the battlefield, as the problems with the left begin with the British assault. Well, and just want to say thank you for pointing out the maps. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the maps. I, I wanted to show the ranges to show, you know, that what you know, how the units would, would move into, into range or be out of range. Uh, Edward Alexander worked with me to make the maps. He did a great job. So I'm, I'm very proud of the maps. I think they show a lot of detailed and I think that they're the most detailed Brandywine maps out there. But to uh, answer your question, so uh, like we said, the first two divisions are, are, are in line and ready to go. And that third one comes up, it's got uh, two Maryland brigades. Uh, the, the units are commanded by General Prudhomme de Bore. And this was a time when the Continental Army had a flood of uh, European officers coming in. You know, we, we think about Lafayette, of course, who will actually be here in his first battle. But there are, you know, French and Polish and German and all kinds of uh, officers looking for work, looking for promotions. And uh, with the American war going on, it's an opportunity. Debore uh, does not impress anybody that day. And um, it, it's ironic because, you know, we talked about a lot of new units. The, the Maryland regiments were some of the more experienced. They fought at Long Island. Um, you know, they, they, you know, Trenton, Princeton, they, they were combat veterans, some of the best troops in the Continental Army. But they're moving uphill to get into position. They're in column and they get fired upon. They're, they're caught in a, in a roadway that's very narrow, no room to maneuver, can't see the enemy very clearly and they panic. And it's, it's just one of those uh, unpredictables that happens in, in war. Uh, sometimes your best troops drop the ball. And the, uh, the first brigade that's moving forward panics and it runs back into the second brigade, which is behind it. Yes. And uh, some people think that a retreat was ordered. Uh, officers are trying to straighten this out and, 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 and get control of it. 
But the bottom line is that uh, some of the best American troops are immediately thrown out of the battle. Uh, they retreat disorder. Debore says he tries to rally them, but uh, doesn't make a great effort. He's criticized by a lot of the uh, uh, other officers, and he'll actually be, uh, he'll leave, uh, go back to France. Um, now in your research, did you, later. did you find any, you know, uh, accounts that regarding a, an official retreat order or who it may have come from, or was one of those rumors that very quickly runs down the line and, and, and causes mass chaos and confusion? Yeah, it was just a rumor that started. Um, as, as the troops fell back, some thought it must have been an order. And, you know, again, think about the, the situation. It's chaotic. It's, it's fluid. It's happening on the fly. And that's something else that a lot of these troops have never experienced is, um, you know, adjusting uh, out in the open with the enemy in contact. Uh, they, they've often attacked and ambushed. They've often defended a position. But to be out in the open field and maneuver and feel your way, uh, that's a new experience. Oh, 100%. And, and particularly, you know, if they're moving to the right, they're exposing their now would be their left flank as they move to an advancing enemy to, 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 to move the line to link up with the rest of the continental line, um, challenging under the best of circumstances. But you know, what you were saying earlier that you know, 9,000 British in line, uh, this is a site that none of the continentals have seen uh, coming their way before in such massive size like this leading up uh, to the Battle of Brandywine itself. So as we know in linear tactics, um, you know, once a flank gives way, you know, it, it basically exposes the rest of that linear line to um, a, a more assault on their flank and, and almost a domino effect. So the, the left of the, the continental line is, is collapsing. Um, I, we had a, a viewer tonight ask for a shout out to the, the third Virginia uh, that had uh, slowed things down a little bit towards oh, yeah. the, the center of the Union line, um, doing yeoman's work out there but we're ultimately pushed back. Uh, transition our story now, what, what is happening in the, the center uh, of the, the Continental Line, the Pennsylvanians, the right of the Continental Line, the Virginians? Uh, we've got some notables that will become very famous to the American cause that uh, are there towards this sector of the line, if, if you'd like to share that story as well. So uh, once the Marylanders retreat, uh, they're probably on their way to get Ravens tickets or something. Uh, they, they fall back <laughs> and uh, the, the next unit in line, which now becomes the left, are um, some New Jersey troops who, who have a lot of experience and fight very well. And, and one of the more interesting units in the American army, the Canadian regiment, which was composed of French Canadians who uh, fought with the Americans during the war. Uh, there were also some New York and New England troops in that regiment. Uh, many languages, many religions, very interesting case study. But uh, then in the center of the American position is the uh, Pennsylvania Brigade, who were wearing brown coats, just like the manuals, the uniforms are not standardized in the Continental Army. Uh, right. They're going to bear uh, the brunt of the British attack, the Brigade of Guards and the British Grenadiers coming at them. But yeah, you're, one of your uh, readers mentioned the uh, Third Virginia moving forward. Um, out in front of the American position was Birmingham Meeting House, which had a cemetery, Quaker Meeting House. And in front of that was an orchard. And the Third Virginia Regiment, uh, which was from the uh, Fredericksburg, uh, Middle Peninsula area of Virginia, uh, they moved down into that orchard to slow the British down. Uh, only 170 of them. They go forward to slow the British down, buy some time, and they will retreat first to the meeting house where they'll take shelter behind a stone wall. And the British attacking them are the light infantry who eventually work their way around and flank the Virginians. So they fall back to the main line. But that's a, a very important part of the battle. Uh, the American right flank has uh, two Virginia brigades who are the largest units 
on the battlefield that day. And um, Virginia troops from all over uh, South Side Virginia, Western Virginia, what's now West Virginia and Western Pennsylvania. A lot of guys in hunting frocks, they're from the frontier. Uh, attacking them are going to be the uh, German Jaegers, riflemen. Oh, the Americans do have six cannons that are helping out. You know, one of the things I really enjoyed about the book at, at this point of the narrative is uh, really you, you talk about the overall effect of the fire uh, of the Continental Line, the, the importance of the Continental Artillery, those guns that are up there, um, and, and really the devastation that it inflicts on these, these units uh, on the British side. Um, you know, even going down into such my new detail, talking about uh, the musicians out in front of, of the British line. And later on in the book, when you're talking about the casualty statistics, looking at, you know, how many musicians being right up front were, were you know, wounded or killed, um, the effect of the fire on officers, um, just a, a, you know, a great return to military history. We're not getting sidetracked with anything else, um, but this, this battle narrative. Um, so the attack is moving forward. Um, you know, the left of the Continental Line has given way. Uh, the other two divisions of the Continental Line are putting up uh, a brief return fire, and there amongst it all is Lafayette. Uh, tell us a little bit about his arrival to uh, this battlefield and, and what he'll experience and observe that day. Well, Lafayette had recently arrived, and uh, he does not have a command. He's uh, I guess a, still a volunteer aide at this point, but he and some other French officers arrive and they, they end up uh, behind the Pennsylvanian and uh, Lafayette is just doing what he can. He's encouraging the troops. Uh, at one point, he urges them to counterattack against the British, which they, they won't, but he's, he's urging them to do that. And as, as things start to collapse and they take casualties and they'll, they'll start to fall back, Lafayette is there trying to rally the men and keep things organized. Uh, he is wounded. And um, there's, there is a monument to Lafayette on the battlefield. It's, it's a beautiful monument. And it was put up, oh, let me double check the date, 1895. Wow. Uh, but it's not the spot where he was wounded. <laughs> uh, I think it's about a quarter mile away. Uh, it's, it's my interpretation. Um, and there's no place to park. It's right next to a narrow, busy road. But anyway, uh, that's one of the prominent landmarks is the Lafayette Monument on the battlefield. And he'll uh, end up recovering in the town of Bethlehem later on. And that really, uh, you know, one of the things I found interesting and I didn't realize how much of an impact this first battle that Lafayette experiences there with the Continental Line, um, really being an active participant in the battle itself, even that in that advisory role, how much of a relationship that Lafayette has with that battlefield, how much he talks about it uh, in the post-war era uh, during his return to uh, America in, in the early 19th century. So um, a really interesting part of the story. Uh, but you talked about the casualties that they're experiencing. Lafayette is among them. The Continental Line is, is beginning to give way. Uh, as the British push up Birmingham Hill and reach the American positions, uh, obviously we know that the Americans will, won't be able to hold out forever and they begin to, to fall back. Um, where are they headed? What orders are coming down the lines to these divisions, these brigades? Um, is there reinforcements on the way? Uh, what's going to stop this, this British push? So again, um, the British units who are attacking are the, the Brigade of Guards, which are elite troops, the Brigade of uh, Grenadiers, the Brigade of Light Infantry, and the regular troops are behind them. But the, the bulk of the fighting is done by those British special units. And then there, there's a Hessian Grenadier Brigade, Hessian Light Infantry, and German Jaegers. Um, as they push the Americans back and the Americans fall back uh, to their south behind them, um, it's starting to get dusk, starting to get late in the day, and reinforcements arrive, a division under General Nathaniel Green, two Virginia brigades, and the, the last of the fighting takes place uh, south of Birmingham Hill around a community called uh, 
Now I Dilworth? Forget. Dilworth Town. Dilworth Town. And um, the fighting goes up until dark when battles usually end because it's too dark to see. But uh, the British do send in fresh troops, uh, as do the Americans. And there's some, some pretty heavy fighting. Uh, one thing I found interesting was uh, another unit that arrives and goes into battle, which I wasn't sure about, is the North Carolina Brigade. Oh, wow. There were nine regiments of North Carolina Continentals. Um, they had been sent up to Washington's main army. This is their first battle. Some of them were involved in smaller actions in North Carolina, but this is their first big battle. They're very understrength. There's not a lot of them. But uh, in a lot of books you see, uh, they talk about the North Carolina Brigade as part of the army, but they don't talk about them being in the fight. And some books even say that they weren't. Hmm. But I've seen casualty reports. So they were. <laughs> they absolutely wow. were. They, they took losses. So the fighting dies down that night, and the, the Americans will pull back. The British will stay on the field. You know, as we begin to kind of wrap up the battle narrative, uh, for those that are jo joining us this evening, if you have any questions for Bert, feel free to drop those into the uh, chat. We'll have some time for questions here in just a few moments. Um, the battle is over. You have a chapter in the book that talks about the aftermath. Uh, one of the things that, that you and I were talking about before we went live this evening um, is really bringing to life the aftermath of the battle. You know, when we talk about casualties on both sides, normally historians, uh, talk in ambiguous numbers, would translate those numbers into percentages um, based upon the number that are involved in the fight. But one of the things I think that is a, a real benefit in this book is the amount of time you spent pulling uh, pensions and really getting into individual soldiers' stories from the battle itself, uh, the type of wounds they received, where they recovered, how long they recovered, and in many cases, taking us through the rest of the war, the rest of their lives, and how the battle uh, at Birmingham Hill, you know, changed them uh, forever. Um, so tell us a little bit uh, about, you know, the overall outcome. Uh, you know, what are the casualties like on both sides? Um, you know, are these uh, you know, armies considerably fatigued. I mean, you mentioned other battles coming up in, in, in the several days leading, uh, or excuse me, after uh, Birmingham Hill. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, the casualties, the impact on these armies, and, and how that may influence uh, some future movements on both sides. So you mentioned some of the sources I used. One of the things I wanted to do was, you know, I, I tried to look, obviously look at every account you know, eyewitness account, whether it was a report or a letter or, or whatever from both sides. But I, I've, I've done research with pension accounts before, and they're fascinating. Um, and the, the backstory on those is in 1832, that's 50 years after the revolution, uh, the federal government uh, started to grant pensions to Revolutionary War veterans. They had to prove uh, provide proof of service, have a witness, and so on. And they had to describe, you know, what unit they were in, what they did during the war. And some of these pension accounts have have nothing. Uh, they're, they're just, you know, very, very plain. They don't have any details. And some some have you know, they're full of errors. Um, you know, think about writing fifty years after an event. How much would you remember? But some are incredibly detailed, vividly detailed. It's like these guys remembered so much and and so yes so i was able to find great great accounts about people being hit in the arm or stabbed by a bayonet or talking about you know loading their muskets in the heat of battle and those those details are, are found nowhere else so that that's one thing that i thought could really add to the story as as far as the casualties the americans lose about 1300 that day there is fighting elsewhere the British lose 580. So obviously the American losses are twice as high. Um, I, I would say both armies are uh, worn down, but, but by no means are these crippling losses. The Americans will fall back towards Philadelphia, regroup. Uh, the British will stay on the battlefield for a few days, treat the wounded, bury the dead, and then move on. And of course, the rest of the campaign unfolds. We have the, the Paoli bayonet attack a couple days later, a brutal night attack. Uh, 
Washington will you know, maneuver around with the British for a couple weeks. The British will get into Philadelphia, occupy it. Washington counterattacks a German town, comes very close to knocking the British out, and then falls back to Valley Forge. And that's where the winter, you know, spends the winter at Valley Forge, close enough to be within striking distance of Philadelphia, but not too close that the British can attack him without warning. And the army goes through a lot of reforms at Valley Forge. So Brandywine is the first step in, in that campaign, that series of events. Well, I, I will tell our, our viewers tonight that uh, Bert's book wraps up with a really interesting chapter um, that we're not going to get into in our discussion tonight because um, we have a lot of questions for you, Bert. But, um, but the last chapter really looks at the development of the, the preservation movement for not only at Brandywine, but battlefields in general, and, and has a, a comparative dialogue in that chapter looking at the preservation of Civil War battlefields versus the preservation of Revolutionary War battlefields. And it's definitely, uh, for me, uh, was uh, one of the many highlights of the book to read about why you know the preservation of um, Revolutionary War battlefields looks a little different uh, than it did for Civil War battlefields in American history. Um, you even talk a little bit about how uh, active Confederate veterans of the American Civil War were active in preserving Revolutionary War battlefields such as at Kings Mountain. So I uh, definitely encourage everyone to pick up the book and particularly for that chapter. Um, but um, uh, Frank has a question tonight. Uh, did the British have better intelligence about the terrain than the Americans? And is it is it that intelligence that enabled the British to win at Brandywine? Great question. Yes. It's ironic because the Americans are on home soil, right? Home field advantage. But um, there's a lot of Quakers in this area who were neutral. And there were a good number of loyalists. And the British had loyalist guides who knew the road network, who guided them around the American army. And that's why Washington got bad intelligence uh, throughout the morning. The locals were not necessarily hostile, but they weren't necessarily uh, supportive of the army either. All right, what about, uh, we've had a question about uh, if you could comment on the performance of you know, the division commanders uh, in the Continental Line, uh, particularly Sterling's performance um, that day, uh, you know, the ones that had the pullback. What, what is, in your opinion, their, their performance? Do they, should they suffer any blame or own up to the defeats for pulling their guys out of line? Uh, what's your thoughts on the, the, the leaders on the Continental uh, Line that afternoon? Um, the, the, Overall American commander on this part of the battlefield is John Sullivan. He commands what we call a wing of three divisions. Uh, Sullivan gets a lot of blame and uh, he spends a lot of time writing to defend himself. I think he does very well. I think he does uh, as good as he could with the situation, very fluid and the troops that he has. Uh, Sullivan is all over the place, making sure things are, are going smoothly. I think Sullivan does well. Um, I think Sterling does too. I think Stephen does as well. Um, Stephen commands the Virginia regiments brigades on the, on the right flank of the army. Um, Sterling has the, uh, the Pennsylvania and New Jersey troops in the middle. Those guys do fine. Uh, Debore, of course, gets an F. Um, you know, it's not necessarily anyone's fault that things go to pieces, but it's how you handle that. And he really just did not uh, get a handle on that situation. We had a great question regarding him, uh, actually, uh, from Nancy. Nancy wants to know, do you think that his lack of fluency in English contributed to the collapse of his command that day? I'm sure it was a barrier uh, to communication with his officers. So, yeah, I'm sure it was a challenge and it made things, you know, in a stressful situation. Um, yes, I'm sure. I don't know that it would be uh, critical. I, I don't know that it would make the, the real difference, though. All right. Uh, John is asking us about the uh, particularly uh, we talked about Lafayette tonight, but there's many other European officers that are starting to arrive with the Continental Army. Uh, John wants to know, you know, do you think these these relatively new but experienced European officers are they a help to the Americans or a hindrance to the Americans? 
Well, I'll tell you what Washington would say. <laughs> uh, he and a lot of his officers uh, are starting to get tired of it. Um, I, I guess it depends. It depends. Obviously, Lafayette works out. Pulaski works out. He's here. It's his first battle with the Continental Army. Um, one of the problems it creates is the the American officers are are very jealous of their ranks and and their careers, and they're very frustrated to see these Europeans come in and automatically get get to be a general or command a brigade or a division somewhere. And so it creates a lot of hard feelings and tension in the American officer corps. And I think Washington struggled to find the right balance of of using men who had talent and ability and finding the right way to make them fit in. Uh, Von Steuben kind of falls into his role. Uh, that wasn't planned, but it worked beautifully. So it, it, it's a real challenge. Uh, Robert would like to know, did any part of the battle start at the famed Longwood Gardens proxy? Longwood Gardens is a, uh, it's a big botanical garden in the area, a beautiful spot. There was fighting moving through there as the, uh, the wing that is supposed to occupy Washington and divert him moves forward. They go past it along Route 1. Uh, so it's sort of a, a, a running skirmish to get uh, as the, uh, the British and Germans move towards Brandywine Creek. So there is fighting that moves past it, but not, not a lot. Well, we got uh, two more questions for you tonight, Bert. There's some excellent questions from our viewers. One is in regards to the aftermath. We were talking a little bit about the casualties. Uh, and you mentioned that the, the Quaker House, the Birmingham Meeting House, was one such place that casualties were treated. The British stay in command of the battlefield for the following several days. They're burying the dead. They used the Birmingham Meeting House as a hospital. Are there any other structures that were used as hospitals in the surrounding area to the battlefield during the, the days and weeks? following the battle. I mean, it, it's just like a Civil War battlefield. So every every structure around, uh, you know, it, it's a farming community. There, there's scattered farms, not a lot of people. And there's there never been 20,000 people in Chester County, Pennsylvania before. So wow. yeah, um, there are a few other historic houses in the area that were, you know, that are available to see and, and visit. That were used as hospitals. Um, I didn't do a lot of digging into that, but yes, uh, any any farmhouse, barn, whatever in the area was was used. Greg wants to know this evening um, because we didn't touch on it. Can you talk very briefly, as we're quickly running out of time tonight? Pulaski's charge nearing the end of the battle. I honestly did not research that because my main focus was the, the fighting on Birmingham Hill. So I just, I talk a little bit about what happens afterwards up to the end, but um, sorry, I really can't speak to that. Um, and last, our last question comes from Mike tonight. Can you describe Washington's role after he repositioned troops to meet the British advance? Um, Washington himself does not go to Birmingham Hill. Uh, John Sullivan, like I said, it commands the three divisions that are up there. He trusts Sullivan. Washington stays uh, closer to the Brandywine Creek and Chad's Ford, the river crossing, uh, because he's still got several divisions of his army, almost half of it's still there. And the British are advancing towards the creek and he wants to stay there and see how things develop. Uh, but it's by the evening, everybody's moving down Route 1. So Washington himself doesn't go up to Birmingham Hill. So question then from, from me tonight is, do you think that uh, is a mistake uh, by Washington for not moving to the active front, more active front? I think it's surprising uh, that he, he didn't, but he must have thought he had a good reason not to. Um, I don't know that it's a mistake. I don't know that he could have necessarily done anything better or different or turned it around, maybe. But um, for whatever reason, he felt he needed to stay 
with the other half of the army. Well, I want to thank you uh, so much for joining us this evening, Bert. Um, again, Bert's new book, Decision at Brandywine, The Battle on Birmingham Hill with West Home Publishing. Uh, I can't recommend this book enough. It is a very quick read because the narrative is that engaging. Uh, you're going to feel like you're on the ground with these, these guys and you're going to, to really um, enjoy your experience with this book. Where can uh, folks pick this up if they don't already have a copy? Easiest way is West Home Publishing. They have a website which lists all their books. They have a lot of great titles. Um, for people in the area, I believe it's at the Brandywine Battlefield Park and the Revolutionary Museum in Philadelphia. So if, if you're in that part of Pennsylvania, uh, but again, probably just the easiest thing to do is look at West Holmes website. All right. Well, before we uh, let you all go this evening, I got some more information about those things we talked at at the beginning of the program. Uh, in two weeks on April 17th is our next Rev War Revelry. And believe it or not, it is our two year anniversary. Uh, of doing these revelries. Uh, a wide variety of us will be on uh, that evening. We'll be talking about some of our, our recent research uh, projects that we're currently involved in uh, and many of our upcoming programs, such as the ERW Symposium, uh, which will be held on September 24th, uh, partnering again with Gadsby's Tavern Museum and the Lyceum in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, the great lineup of speakers that day, the theme for the day, the world turned upside down, the American Revolution's impact on a global scale. Uh, so you're definitely not going to want to miss that. You can find out more information uh, about that symposium in September on EmergingRevolutionaryWar.org. And our fall bus tour, our second annual bus tour, taking place November 11th through the 13th. Uh, the title of the tour this year, The Rise of the American Army. Valley Forge and the Battle of Monmouth. Our guides will be ERW historians uh, Phil Greenwalt and Billy Griffith. And uh, if you were with us this past November on our first bus tour, you know it is a, a great time, a lot of scholarship, a lot of fellowship that weekend uh, with folks interested in this, this time period. So you're not going to want to miss out on that. Again, you can sign up uh, for that uh, as well at emergingrevolutionaryward.org. If you have any questions on either the symposium or bus tour, feel free to contact us on the website as well. Uh, so on behalf of Emerging Revolutionary Worth and uh, Bert Dunkerley, we'd like to thank you for joining in this evening. We'll see you in two weeks for our next revelry, the two-year anniversary uh, of our revelries. Until then, take care, be well, and we'll see you soon.